strategist in the first Bush administration. I mean, in fact, Elliot Cohn's book um, is a criticism mm -hmm. of not enough civilian intervention in military affairs. I mean, Papa Bush blew it is sort of the line that many people came who came into the second Bush administration arguing. And so they would have the view that, hey, this Scowcroft guy is good at organizing meetings and train wrecks, but he's not good at anticipating train wrecks. And this was a giant strategic failure. Um, I would put it as a middling strategic blunder, um, and by which I mean this. We have to look at what happened in the aftermath of the Gulf War, I think, on two levels. The first is what happened in, uh, in Iraq and in, and in Kurdistan and in other places around and inside the country where we see unexpected levels of violence and, and honestly, ethnic cleansing. Put that on one level and then take a, a broader level and say, what do we see happening within the broader international community and within America's role within the Middle East? I would suggest that the Bush administration underestimated the turmoil that was going to come in Iraq in the aftermath of the conflict, but not because they didn't think about it, mm. because they just got it wrong. Wrong on this level. What was the expectation that would, uh, of what would happen in Iraq after the Iraqi army is, is thoroughly embarrassed and defeated? The expectation was that the Iraqis would do as Iraqis had always done, and there would be a military coup. Right. Because Saddam Hussein had just staked our entire reputation on something, gotten our, ourselves embarrassed internationally, gotten our boys killed, that he is not going to last. And in fact, I think if you go back and you were to ask people within the Bush administration during the period of the 100-hour 100 100 war, excuse me, 100-hour war, if you were to ask them how long Saddam was going to last, they wouldn't look at their calendars, they would look at their watches. And the expectation was that his odds of survival are very low. So I think they clearly got that one wrong, which led, of course, to a tremendous amount of violence, especially when people interpreted the president's words, suggesting that they should rise up against Saddam and then did not receive any American existence, which, by the way, had never been promised. We can't necessarily fault people for how they interpret what we say, but we need to be careful about what we say. But I would say that on an order of magnitude scale, and I have to, I don't want to be um, dismissive of the suffering of people within Iraq in the aftermath, but on an order of magnitude scale, that's very low on the order of magnitude compared to the problems that they actually consciously avoided by not going into Iraq. Again, this was already alluded to, but uh, James Baker had a wonderful line about this in his second memoir, um, <laughs> which uh, he said, which came out in 2006. He said, you know, people used to ask me why we never went all the way to Baghdad. Yeah. Nobody asks me that anymore. <laughs> uh, and I think that this because that they were fully aware of the problems that they would be opening up if they went all the way. So while I think that we could argue that their strategic mistake, that they made a strategic mistake in not ensuring greater control over what could have happened in Iraq in the immediate aftermath, the only way that they could have ensured control over what happened in Iraq in the immediate aftermath would have led to a much, much bigger mistake yeah. in their minds. And to be honest, this is one of those moments where they say two things. First, war is, is by definition uncertain. We don't know what's going to happen, so let's at least control the mistakes that we don't make. Mm -hmm. And secondly, again, I have to go back to the idea that there is a full expectation that Saddam Hussein is not going to survive m multiple weeks in power. Mm -hmm. um, I have not found any intelligence document whatsoever that suggests that Saddam Hussein has a long-term future in Iraq after the Gulf War. So everybody gets that one wrong. Um, but because everyone gets that wrong and the president can only operate with the best information he has, one can see at least why he made the decision he did. Right. So. Well, uh, I would like to invite any questions about operating style, otherwise the interrogation will continue, and I've got three or four other things I'd like to ask. Sir. Well, you had a chance to speak to the whole audience. Maybe you ought to shut up afterwards. Uh, but let me... It's a question we haven't addressed <laughs> that I'm sort of interested in. And I don't know how much it relates to operating style. The Bush Scowcroft, wonderful Bush Scowcroft book, essentially ends in 1991. There was another year in the Bush presidency known as 1992. 
in which obviously the Soviet Union had just collapsed, various other things were happening around the world. It looks in a lot of ways to be an, a period of markedly diminished energy and attention on foreign policy. Now, one of the explanations that is given is that uh, the, they were shocked at the fact that they'd lost an election in Pennsylvania and that George Bush's foreign policy involvement had been used against him, and therefore the, ga the game was don't do something prominent in foreign policy. And that may be, that may be the story. There is also some evidence of the president being less energetic and less purposive that year than in previous years. Uh, I, I, this is probably outside the scope of your panel, but I think it's, since we're, we're all basically, I think correctly, lauding what the two of them did together and Brent's role in all this, it's also useful mm -hmm. to reflect on what does seem to have been a, a, a you know, a petering out or a, of the action in a way uh, that is, I've never had a full explanation of. Uh, well, first of all, I should say that my book ends in 1991 as well. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but Selection bias. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, but I, let, me, let me take a broad step back, if you will, because I think it really helps to understand why we see less deliberate action in 91 than in previous years. And the reason is President Bush and those around him, Scowcroft to a lesser extent Baker, who I think in this sense is really less a strategist than he was just a tremendous operator. He was a very good lawyer, obviously, a negotiator. But President Bush and Scowcroft in particular had the view that things were going right in the world. In fact, if you go back to President Bush's inauguration, he has a wonderful articulation of this. He says, we know what works. Freedom works, open markets works, democracy works. And it's not just a hubristic, American-centric, American exceptionalism that he's describing. Rather, he's describing something which had been articulated by others through, at the same time, uh, most famously by Francis Fukuyama, yeah. that history was at an end. But again, we need to understand not what we think, what our students understand by that statement, but what Fukuyama actually meant, which is that the questions that had driven human history up until this time over what type of authority we were going to have over us and what type of government we're going to pursue had essentially been resolved, that democracy had won. And Bush actually articulates this, I argue, before Fukuyama and says in his inauguration that man no longer has to sit and talk late into the night over what form of government we should have. The way which I understand this more broadly, it actually goes back to um, Otto von Bismarck, uh, using a phrase that he employed, which I, to be honest, have never heard President Bush employ, but I wish he did, uh, which was to describe the role of the policymaker as looking at the stream of history rolling along and merely dipping his hand into it. Mm -hmm not to change the course of history, but to try to get with the flow. Bush and those around him thought that the world was going in their direction, and frankly had a lot of good evidence for it. Democracy had just won. More importantly, the reason why the story ends in 91 is that democracy seems to have won in the Soviet Union without the civil war we all feared, and without the nuclear war we all had nightmares about. Mm -hmm. America had just proved its military dominance around the world, thereby essentially demonstrating that there was going to be a military power to control the global commons while the rest of the world transitioned into democracy. And even in the places where democracy had not seemed to work, such as in China, in Tiananmen Square, one lesson to draw from that experience had been, well, demo the democratic surge had been suppressed, but it had not been extinguished. If it took that long for China to come into its first exposure to democracy, give it time, it'll get there over time. So consequently, I think by 91, you can make a very good argument that the Bush administration says, we have essentially gotten the world that we want because it's moving in the right direction down the stream of history. And anything that we do that would be proactive is more likely to be pulling against the stream of history than flowing with it. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we can essentially bide our time and figure out who this Yeltsin person is figure out maybe we can finally solve the Middle East problem because we know that things are still moving in the right direction. And frankly, I, I think that that in itself is not wrong, that the world is more interconnected now, the world is more democratic now, the, more, the world is more prosperous now, uh, 
as a general pro pro rule than it was when Bush took office. So I think you could argue that the Bush administration chose at that moment not to do things that they were not sure about the outcome because things will work out in the end. I'm, I'm you, you didn't like the last part there, did you? Mostly right, but they also kind of stopped talking about it, stopped emphasizing it. I mean, it was, I mean, it was not, not a very visible part of the Bush campaign, except for NAFTA, which was, a, which was an achievement which had the political advantage of dividing the Democrats and uniting the Republicans. But it was, it was a sort of a sense of, I thought there was a, you know, there was a sort of a, I remember actually talking once to Brent Scowcroft about this. It wasn't a long conversation. It was inside of a conference at Princeton. And he basically said that, you know, the people and, uh, you know, the, po the political people thought that, you know, foreign policy was a negative. I think that was during the campaign, and therefore they wanted to uh, step back, and, and in terms, at least in terms of, uh, you know, bragging or talking about it. I always thought that was interesting. You know, you get, that you get we're going to play, play in the other guy's court <laughs> with the sun in our eyes because we're going to, you know, let, let Clinton define the terms of the debate rather than them defining it. You know, I'm not sure that that's a, uh, I, I think that's exactly what they did, and I'm yeah. not sure, to be honest, it's the incorrect reading of the electorate at that time. I, 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 I'm not sure that be. any further discussion of foreign policy was going to play to Bush's favor, but right. one other reason to remember that they stopped talking about foreign policy is that foreign policy itself calms down. Yeah. You know, if we list the crises that occurred during this administration, and by the way, it's a long list, yeah. most of them occurred at before right. 1991. Um, so, you know, you think about Tiananmen, you think about the Gulf Wars over at that time, the Berlin Wall, all the Velvet Revolutions, t Panama, which of course doesn't even get discussed in President Bush and General Scowcroft's memoirs. All those things occur, and so there is not necessarily a headline-grabbing issue for the President to be out in front talking about yeah. at the same moment that there is a general discussion within the electorate, much like we're seeing today, yes. that uh, local economic issues are what yeah. are going to the determine The electorate things. was thinking, what have you done for me lately? Yeah. That's all very nice, but we're suffering yeah. economically. Yeah. Can, can I ask you, I, I really appreciate foreign policies that reference Bismarck and the flow of history. That I've got a big Bismarck poster in my room uh, at home. But when do you think they got things wrong? That seems to me a good way of looking at the world. But when, when did that not work? When did that philosophy and kind of guiding principle for foreign policy let down Bush 41? It clearly didn't work in Panama. Um, uh, and you, to, to understand that statement, you have to remember that there was an aborted coup. Actually, that wasn't an aborted coup. It was a foil coup. Uh, in Panama in uh, October, I believe. That, do I have that right? October of 89, um, wherein um, General Scowcroft afterwards said, uh, they said that we look like Keystone Cops, and you know what? We were Keystone Cops. Um, that we really did not pass information between ourselves properly, and we did not react properly. Um, to give you the basics of what occurred, um, there was a major who went to the U.S. Southern Command post and essentially explained to U.S. Southern Command that he was going to have a coup over the next 72 hours, and all he wanted the American troops to do was to go out and stand basically in the middle of the road and keep Saddam Hussein's forces from getting to the palace. There we go. I'm sorry. My, my bad. Well, they were also hoping to keep the Iraqis out. Um, <laughs> To keep Noriega's troops, thank you, from, yeah, from, um, from, getting, from getting to the palace where the coup was taking place. Um, this went back to the White House and actually went back through the Pentagon, which is, I think, an important part of the story. And Colin Powell, who one must recall, was not only on his first week on the job, this was, I kid you not, his first day on the job as chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And Cheney, not, uh, Secretary of Defense Cheney, neither of them had any faith in the major's abilities to pull this off or in the major's ability to subsequently not be a worse dictator. So they um, frankly did not pass along a lot of information back to the White House. They uh, got the White House's approval not to have their troops do anything, but they subsequently um, did not pass along further information to the president including the key fact that Noriega had, in fact, been captured. And we know this because the coup was announced over by Noriega on television at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. At 6 p.m. in the afternoon that same day, 
Uh, President Bush writes in his diary, we still don't know where Noriega is or if he's still been captured. Essentially, and Cheney has, has, in his memoirs, actually admits very candidly that they did not pass along all the information because they did not think that the information they were going to pass along was going to be helpful for their position, which was to keep U.S. troops from being engaged in this problem in Panama. Um, afterwards, you, know, you can imagine what happens in the newspapers and what happens on the, the television programs of the tremendous ridicule that the Bush administration suffers when recognizing that they had the potential to solve one of the long-standing thorns in America's side in Central America and chose not to do anything. And there are two in interesting moments that occur uh, afterwards, both involving General Scowcroft. Um, the first is uh, his appearance subsequently on um, one of the Sunday morning news programs, you'll have to forgive me, I forget which, but with Senator um, Boren, I believe. And Senator Boren essentially was going on the program in order to describe just how terrible the administration had been in not supporting this coup. And Scowcroft, who we've already heard as being both mild-mannered and, as I would describe him, diminutive, um, just about gets into a fist fight with Boren in the green room beforehand because he is so upset over the fact that this senator has the temerity to accuse them of blowing this operation. Interestingly enough, he says nothing to that effect while on television. And subsequently, President Bush calls Boren into the Oval Office and listens to his description of the ways the administration had messed up with Scowcroft in the room, with Cheney in the room, with Powell in the room, and subsequently thanks Boren for, for pointing out exactly the places they screwed up, because you know what, Boren was right. And closed the door, and President Bush said, I need to have a chat with these gentlemen, um, none of which looked like they wanted to be chatted with. Um, and this is an occasion, I think, where the administration did not handle things well, because the presumption had been, if we don't know what's going to happen, let's not do anything, because ultimately, things will work out best for us, that did lead them, in this instance, to not act. And, by the way, led Scowcroft to then take a review within the NSC about how it was that we need to get better and how do we need to pass information better. One of the ways, by the way, was to get the Pentagon to pass information like they're supposed to back to the NSC. So it's always the Pentagon. Your yes. Grace? Uh, thank you. I, I, I really don't have a question. I just thought if I stood up here behind a, mic, a microphone, Jeff would finally stop talking. <laughs> I, I don't, I can refute that right now. This is great. <laughs> Sit down, I got more to say. Um, on this uh, theme that you introduced, Jason, uh, of when things didn't work right, you, you mentioned um, Jeff Panama, but I, I'd be very interested in your reflections on something a little bit bigger that didn't work quite right, and that is the... Um, aftermath of the Soviet defeat in Afghanistan. Hmm. Um, when we decided our work here is done, mm -hmm. um, we could see the Afghan civil war coming, but not our problem. Um, uh, we moved away from Pakistan, which had been our most allied of allies, to becoming our most sanctioned of adversaries. And it's arguably the beginning of the road to 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I don't see very much written about this, and I certainly haven't heard very much said about it by the principals of the time. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, the discussion and the decision-making um, uh, uh, in 1989 uh, and the year or two after that? What, what was the the tenor of the conversation, who stood where, what views were aired. Um, uh, it, it's just a, a chapter of the 41 administration that uh, I think is significant, but has had uh, rather little attention. I think I am in complete agreement with you that it's a chapter that needs to be written. It's a book that needs to be written, several books that need to be written. Um, and I think the documents are largely available. Um, so I'm hoping that somebody does uh, look into that further. The general sense I have of discussions over Afghanistan is now that the Soviets, because remember the Soviets leave in 89, early of 89, um, and in fact this is really one of the first uh, 
test cases, if you will, for how the incoming Bush administration thinks they can trust and rely upon Gorbachev to keep his word. Yeah. Is he going to actually keep his word that they're going to pull Soviet troops out and they subsequently do? The vacuum that occurs subsequently, though, I think is dealt with more as an international police matter in many ways than as a democracy promotion matter or as certainly as a military matter. And I'll give you a good e example of that. Um, in early 1990, in February of 1990, uh, Secretary of State Baker traveled to Moscow and had lengthy discussions with um, Foreign Minister Shevardnadze and Mikhail Gorbachev over Europe and the future of Germany and the future of NATO. And this is, in fact, the weekend where uh, Baker gives his famous pledge to Gorbachev, never written, only given orally, and never agreed to by Gorbachev, that NATO would not extend one inch to the east. <laughs> While those conversations were going on, sec uh, I almost, excuse me, I almost said Secretary Gates. He was not yet Secretary Gates, but Robert Gates, who of course is national, Deputy National Security Advisor, is having a meeting with the head of the KGB um, in a different part of the building. M much of their discussion focuses on Afghanistan. Uh, and we now have the transcript of the discussion. And one of the interesting things that occurs during this meeting is the Soviet official handing Gates a list of names and pointing out that these names were all Afghanis who were involved in the international drug trade in Europe. And then pointing out, and I remember these are two spy masters talking to each other, and then saying essentially, you know how pleasurable it is to kill two birds with one stone. And the reason was that he also knew that the Americans by going in and taking out these people in the drug trade would be going out and taking out people who were essentially enemies of the Soviet presence in Afghanistan. And so the reason I bring up that vignette, first of all, is that is just how blatant that conversation was. I mean, it really was. It, it, the, the transcripts in the archive, I encourage anybody to go see it. It's really amazing um, about basically, you know, Gates accepts that he is accepting the death warrant for all of these people because the Americans are going to find them and take them out for their drug offenses, but the, that is significant and that it also is something going to destabilize the political structure of Afghanistan, but that seems less important to the Americans at that point than cleaning up the drug trade, which seems to be the bigger issue coming out of Afghanistan in the future. So that's as far as, the, as I see them perceiving Afghanistan as a problem initially. As long as the Soviets get out and the drugs stay in, everything else will take care of itself, which I th obviously is proven to be wrong. So. It's fair to say that the 41 foreign policy team, they're kind of like the dream team. If you had to unwind the Cold War and do it in a way that avoided the Civil War or the uh, interve Soviet intervention in German unification, that you'd want these people on the ground to do the job. So the, I've always been puzzled about subsequent administration's interactions with Scowcroft. And I'm thinking back to the 2002 op-ed in the Wall Street Journal where Scowcroft said, be careful what you're doing in Iraq. And it's basically a full-throated, this is not a good idea. Mm -hmm. And my reading of the history is that he's sort of not taken seriously in the 43 administration. But in contrast, it seems like the current president has a bit of a man crush on Scowcroft? I mean, he really likes Scowcroft's well, foreign I, policy. Yeah, I think the current president has been very clear that Bush 41 is his foreign policy hero. Um, and the whole, because for the same reason, the whole administration and the whole notion of, of restraint. Let me, let me go back, and at the, at the risk of reinforcing Ryan's point that I don't shut up, um, let me go back and refute everything which has been said today. Um, which is that one of the key points that has always brought up. That makes it worth it. It does, yeah. One of the key points that's always brought up, and I've reinforced it myself within the Bush administration of why it was so successful, is the solidarity and the friendship and the camaraderie and the like-mindedness of all the policymakers. Um, that we have an instance where anybody within the administration will tell you the fact that Baker and Cheney and Scowcroft all go back many years, many generations essentially together and could trust each other and therefore could tell their deputies to trust each other that that was 